All right, thank you so much for, for joining us um, for the second session on the post-secondary data partnership. Um, in this session, we're going to talk about how to use these dashboards as a tool to advance equity, which hopefully will be relevant to you, as I know many of you have equity plans at your institutions. So I'm Laurie Haycock. I'm the Senior Advisor of Data and Analytics at Achieving the Dream. Joining me today is Dr. Bobby Fry, who's one of our Strategic Data and Technology Coaches. Jake Kavari, who's the Dean of IE at Marino Valley, Valley College, and Ken McVeary and Dr. Lisa Stick, who are Senior Specialists for Data Partnerships at the National Student Clearinghouse. As we go through today's session, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them in real time, but we'll definitely get to them um, during a Q&A at the end of the session. So this is part two of um, the PDP sessions. We just did one um, an hour ago on, you know, kind of the history of why the post-secondary data partnership was formed to answer the call for better data. And this workshop really focuses on how the PDP and these dashboards can be a tool to help you communicate and advance equity, especially when you scaffold the dashboards with equity-minded sense-making. So in this session, we're going to kind of unpack what that means. What does equity-minded mean? What does sense-making mean? What does it mean when you put those together? Um, some common obstacles to discussing and addressing equity and some recommended equity-minded responses. We're going to show you an example of a student persona that a college has crafted to help show the intersectional social identities of students who are representative of their population. We're going to show you how you can use an intersectional approach to disaggregating data via the PDP dashboards or other dashboards you might have access to. And we're going to talk about language because when you're analyzing data and talking about language, discussing it and reporting on it, it's really important that you use asset-based language versus deficit-minded language. Then we're going to engage you in an equity making sense um, session with a tool developed by the Center for Urban Education Racial and Equity Leadership Academy. And then we'll give you copies of that template that you can use to replicate these sense-making sessions back on your campus. So what do we mean by equity-minded? Um, so a lot of this is pulling from the book from Equity Talk to Equity Walk, which was written by Tia Brown McNair, Estella Ben Simon, and Lindsay Malcolm Pugh, who is a is an institutional researcher. And when they talk about equity mindedness, they refer to the mode of thinking exhibited by practitioners who are willing to assess our own racialized assumptions acknowledge our lack of knowledge and the history of race and racism, take responsibility for the success of historically underserved and minoritized student groups, and to critically assess racialization in our own practices as educators or administrators. It's really practitioner focused and holding the mirror up to ourselves. And kind of that shift from students being college ready to, to colleges being student ready. So quick in the poll, if you could just pop in. Um, if you have read the book or are familiar, I know there, there's um, Tia has been doing like the national speaking rounds, um, but just to give us a sense of whether you've, you've read that book or not, if you could pop that in the chat, that would be terrific. Um, so Estella Bensamon, one of the, her key points is that our focus should not be coming, should be on becoming best practitioners and not focusing our work on best practices. We hear a lot about best practices, high impact practices, but really this, this work in becoming equity leaders starts with us being the best practitioners. Um, so some of the case examples and campus reflections that are included in, in the book are how do we build an equity-minded campus culture? Because right, 
culture eats strategy for breakfast is the, the famous quote. So having that culture is so critical. How do we use and communicate data as a tool to advance equity, which we're gonna drill into today. Looking at our strategic priorities and our equity goals and how do all of those align, right? So that they're cascading from each other and that there are equity goals in our strategic plans. And then we all start out as first generation equity practitioners. So how do we build our own capacity and muscle um, to move beyond that first generation and build maturity in our approach? And part of that is in, involves interpreting equity gaps as a signal that some of the practices and programs and policies and structures that we have in place may not be working as intended and asking equity-minded questions about that. Who are we serving? Who are we advantaging? And who are we failing to serve by looking at who's experiencing, you know, not just focusing on success rates and those who succeed, but also looking at who isn't so that we can drill in deeper. So these are some of the barriers and disruptors to talking about racial equity and some sample equity-minded responses. Some of these clearly map to data work and our work as data practitioners. Obstacle one, claiming not to see race, right? And an equity-minded response is that critical race theory, right? And understanding race critically. Um, obstacle two, not being able or willing to notice racialized consequences. Um, and obstacle three, skirting around race, right? And so we need to, and some examples of that in practice are when institutions want to focus on poverty because that's easier to talk about than to really drill, drilling into race. Um, resisting calls to disaggregate data by race and ethnicity. And sometimes we also see people or in data that's presented um, practices that mask inequities because they group students into underrepresented minorities or BIPOC, like Black, Indigenous, people of color. And when they're grouped, sometimes that mask the, the inequities. Substituting race talk with poverty talk, um, centering whiteness in our practices, evasive reactions to racist inst incidents versus calling attention to the saliency of whiteness, the incapacity to see institutional racism and familiar routines, and a response is self-remediation of our routine practices and really looking at those through an equity lens. Obstacle nine, the myth of universalism. Obstacle 10, which some of you might have experienced in data conversations that you've been a part of, seeing racial inequities as a reflection of academic deficiency or kind of the blame game. Like at the community college, it might be the high schools didn't, you know, prepare the students, or you know, the students weren't motivated, they were too busy socializing in high school or the students are unprepared, right? It's a lot of um, not taking institutional responsibility. Um, and so as you become more echo-minded, you look through that lens of why practices work better for certain students than they do for others. And as we move from becoming more equity-minded our shift, focus shifts from focusing on racial inequities to focusing on racial equity, from blaming students to that institutional responsibility, from deficit centric to being success informed, from you know, looking at race specificity, not grouping everybody into underrepresented minority, and not avoiding race, right? Really making that salient in the work we do. So some ways that we can do that through data disaggregation um, means adding this sense making once we identify that there are equity gaps. We have to go that next step and actually engage in, in these conversations and recognize that we can introduce bias in our data analyses, interpretation, and discussions. So by 
what we choose to measure, how we aggregate and compare, and how we show things. And so we want to be really mindful of that um, as data practitioners. Um, so part of equity-minded data disaggregation is understanding that different identities are salient in different contexts, you know, not aggregating um, students into groups that mask inequities, don't othering people by labeling them and, you know, other in their report. Um, we do a lot of work at Achieving the Dream with tribal colleges and universities and the Native Americans have shared repeatedly that they're often invisible because they're asterisked out because they're small populations. So a lot of data analysis focus on white, Hispanic, African American, Asian, and they become invisible. Um, so if you do have small subpopulations, finding a way to display that data in a sub analysis or something where they're still um, valued and not identical, I, you know, not invisible. Consider, consider how identity groups factor into your story, that intersectional lens, and recognize that they're intersectional, right? I'm a woman, I'm a, I'm a mother, I'm, um, you know, white, I am definitely an older adult, right? An adult learner, right? So I have all of, I bring all of those intersectionalities with me as a student or as a learner. So recognizing that we're not um, discrete characteristics. So this is a social identity wheel. And again, many of us have multiple um, facets of this wheel that we bring to us as our learners do. And I think a really powerful thing of the post-secondary data partnership dashboards is it allows you to look at the intersection of these characteristics and the impact on student outcomes. So this is an example of from Am Amarillo College in Texas. And Russell Lowry Hart is their president. And he, every report they do, every community presentation they give features Maria. And Maria is the most representative um, student in their, of their student population. And they do this just to, to help communicate with head and heart. So it's not always about statistics, it's about um, it personalizes the data, right? So Maria is a female, she's a Latina, she's working two part-time jobs, um, she's attending part-time, she intends to, to transfer, she's a health science major, right? So it just kind of shows, you know, it's a good way to represent the intersectionality. Achieving the Dream has a finish line game that we use with colleges that has a multitude of different student personas because looking at a Maria who's representative of your student population is important, but also reflecting the diversity of your population and having characteristics that, or personas that are reflective of the multitude of students that you serve. Um, and this is every year at our conference, we have dream scholars who are just amazing and, and represent all the different student personas that community colleges as open access institutions serve. And so it just kind of grounds us in, this is why we're doing, and we're trying to help all of our students achieve equitable student outcomes at scale. So the PDP can help you have an equity talk and an equity walk by taking that intersectional approach to disaggregating data, but then, using the data that you find in those dashboards to promote these sense-making conversations. So um, Lisa from the Clearinghouse is going to do a demo of the retention persistence PDP dashboard and show you how you can engage in data discovery to identify with that tool where there might be equity gaps. Thanks, Laurie. I will stop sharing. Okay, so um, this is our landing page for our dashboards. And just to show you where retention and persistence sits, this is 
the dashboard we're going to be working today, uh, retention and persistence. We also have a term to term retention and persistence dashboard that really focuses on that term to term persistence. And when we look at our retention and persistence dashboard, we're really talking about students that came back for a second year. So what proportion of our students actually came back for that second year or completed in their first year? We use the terms retention and persistence a little bit differently than you might at your institution. So I wanna start with that. Retention is enrolled for a second year or have already completed a credential after one year. And persistence is students who started at my institution but left and are persisting at another institution. So here is that dashboard. You'll see our typical four quadrant uh, view. This is our uh, retention rate. And you'll see here, this is my test institution. That's a two year institution. You can see that it's uh, the retention rate has is telling me about uh, the percentage of students that have been retained over the past several years and that percentage is going down. It was almost 64% and now it's down to 58. This little um, green bar in the middle is that group that persisted and so we can see that it appears that looks like the it's inching up the percentage of students that are persisting elsewhere as well as growth in this third column, which is students that are no longer enrolled. So this is not just not enrolled at my institution, it's not enrolled at any institution of higher ed that reports to the clearinghouse. So the way that, um, well, let me point out, I can, you can choose here to look at just retention, just persistence or both. So we're gonna focus on retention today and we're gonna use our global filters and dimensions to take a look at how we might look for gaps. So let's start by looking at race and ethnicity. And so we'll see the retention rates here and, and you have to follow the color bars across. And so um, at the risk of um, doing what Lori told us not to do, which was to make some groups invisible, um, for purposes of this exercise, I'm going to do just that and choose the four highest um, volume groups of enrollment at my test institution so that you can see this more clearly. Um, so this blue line here is Asian students with a retention rate of 68%, white students at 62%, Hispanic students at 57%, and black students at 52%. So if we're looking at here a gap between, um, you know, white students at 62 and black students at 52, there's a 10% gap there. You know, there's also a gap between Hispanic and black students. Um, the Asian students is the biggest gap. They're also the smallest population. Um, in this data set, they're about 6% of the population. Um, and we can look at other dimensions as well. So for example, we might look at gender. So we see here there is a, females at 62%, males at 56%, um, about a 6% difference. So what happens if we combine those um, thoughts? So let's go back to race and ethnicity. And then we'll use our filter here to select just females. Here we see that um, Asian students are up to 73%. They've had an increase. And the gaps between the other three groups have collapsed quite a bit. So we have white students at 63, Hispanic at 62, and black students at 58. So a much smaller gap. What happens when we look at male students? 
here we see actually that brings all the groups down a bit, 68%, 61, 54, and down to 50%. So here we've actually expanded the gap between white students and black students is now 11% instead of the 9% that it was originally. So we can continue to use these kinds of filters to layer things on to really look at intersectionality. But for purposes of today's experience, I want to just keep it simple and go back to our original view was, was just looking at the gap that we have for our Black or African American students. Their line is at the bottom all the way across the past six years, and it's been declining in recent years, and we're at 55% completion rate for that student group. So I'll stop sharing, Laurie, and let you take us to the exercise. Thanks, Lisa. All right, we're going to put you, we're going to go into, in a few minutes, um, two breakout rooms, and we're going to engage in a, in a sense-making session using this tool developed by the Center for Urban Education. Um, so let me just um, socialize you, and you might want to snip a picture of this with your phone. Um, Abby will put the the document, the a word template in the um, in the chat, so that this was a tool that you can take back and, and use on your campuses. The word template, um, we can use that as a note taker in the breakout rooms. But we're going to focus on the on Black students experiencing inequities in first year retention, and we're going to talk about what what are our hunches for why this equity gap exists, and we're going to avoid the blaming, you know, blaming the student and using the equity-minded response of focusing on what our college can control. And then we're going to talk about who at the institution can influence student retention, um, what policies, what practices, and what programs do we have that can be accelerators you know, that can in, that support retention or that could possibly be barriers. And as we go through this exercise, um, just encourage you to think about, um, you know, multiple levels. So you might want to talk about what can happen in the classroom that supports retention, what might happen within a department, a division, at a campus level, um, so that you're thinking of that holistically. And again, these are just the kind of exercises that help um, add the why to the data, because again, the data doesn't answer the question, right? It just gives us something to, to focus on and have these conversations about. So I think with the number we have, we'll just go to, to two breakout rooms. Okay, that was great. Um, I'd like to just have each of the two breakout rooms just do a high level, um, just a couple examples of, of what they discussed. Um, so my room was Angela, Deanna, Vicki, Matthew, Wendy, and Jennifer, and Vicki often offered to, to do our recap. Well, I don't know about the offered. I think I was voluntold, but okay. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, roll, but <laughs> we had a really, really great discussion. We had uh, a lot of good um, ideas. Um, I think what we came up with is that people are entrenched in their positions. They've been there a long time, right? Change has to happen. And I think, I'm sorry, I think it was Matthew. Matthew had a really good point that until we understand why 
why this is happening or why um why some people have to give up some things for other for equity to happen right then nothing's going to change they're not they're not going to understand why they have to give up something so that somebody else you know can move up up in the in the ranks um we think that i actually i think that the system is set up so that people of color can fail it's not set up for them to succeed um, and then we also felt, and you guys, anybody can just chime in if I'm not um, saying everything that you wanted me to. But uh, I think the other thing that we said is that the responsibility is uh, belongs to everyone from the janitor or the grounds person all the way up to the president, the board of trustees for these things to happen. Anybody else? Um. Right, and, and that I think too was related to just fostering that sense of belonging, right? That's everybody's, that's everybody's role. Thank you, Vicki, that was awesome. Group two, would you like to share some reflections? Who, who would like to speak on behalf of our group? We had a great discussion. So we had uh, Lisa and Jason and Scott and Jake and Sorrel. We None didn't do any. Follow Vicky. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> you summed it up. <laughs> I, I'll, I can speak a little bit. We we spoke about similar things, um, definitely of um, in this work too, as well as that it's it's everyone's responsibility. And and I, we have plenty of things that we have barriers that are there that need to be removed. And and we discussed various ones. So one of the um, the big one for us was um, definitely connection to to the campus. And so being there uh, for the student and understanding um, your experience goes a long way in just understanding that before before trying to give any advice or move forward with it. So that's some of the big highlights that we had. And then obviously cultural responsive pedagogy and curriculum and, and looking at the practices that we can put in place across our college. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, we talked too about like hiring practices, right? And having faculty and staff that look like our, the communities we serve. Okay, thank you so much. So that's an, you know, I, the, you have the word template and I think that's um, like an activity that you can use at your campus when you're, you're facilitating these, these equity sense making conversations. Let me just share a bit more here. Um, and as you're analyzing data, these are some of the discussion questions, like um, some of these we addressed, right? But you can also say like, what patterns do we notice in the data? Lisa was doing that with her data discovery with the PDP dashboards. Which groups are experiencing equities taking that intersectional lens? Um, what are our hunches about what might be contributing to these gaps? That's the activity we just did. What additional data do we want to collect to better understand the gap? And it might be, you know, students might not have persisted because of housing insecurity or food instability or lack of reliable transportation or, you know, the need for emergency aid. So like if we think of them holistically, um, what else do we need to know to be able, like with COVID, we had a digital equity gap, right? We had a digital divide. Um, and then what equity minded questions um, might we pursue for further inquiry, inquiry and like when you all have equity plans, like what are your equity goals and how can you have these conversations um, and use data to, to facilitate those. So just wanted to talk a little bit about clarity and goals and, and language and, uh, and from a data practitioner perspective, a lot of times we see white centered as the standard by which other students are to achieve that outcome. And we wanna move away from that or even centering it in the majority population to looking to what are our excellent standards? If we want X percentage of students to be retained or we want X percentage of students to achieve the milestone of or completing credit level English and math in the first year, what do we want that standard to be? And then hold and comparing the student groups to that standard, right? And so you're not 
um, centering it on the majority student. And then considering the ways that we operationalize our values and goals. And again, being mindful of bias that we might unintentionally introduce. And that language is so important. We wanna make sure, and we talked about that in our group, our marketing and language that we use with students. And we wanna make sure that language is inclusive, um, that we use asset-based language that's not blaming the student, but is taking institutional responsibility and making sure definitions are clear across audiences. Because a lot of times we hear diversity, equity, inclusion, like group together, but they all mean different things. So what do we mean when we, when we say those words? So here's some examples of equity-minded language, diversity language, and deficit-minded language. So this is this bottom right quadrant is what the kind of language we wanna avoid. We, you know, at risk, underprepared, disadvantaged, untraditional, a lot of things with the word non in it, underprivileged, poor, like students experience poverty. We don't wanna call them poor or, or homeless. Um, we wanna move away from talking about achievement gaps and attainment gaps to equity gaps because achievement, again, puts it back on the student not achieving. Um, so this is, I think, just a nice reference to have as you're writing up data analyses and having this, these conversations um, to have some guidelines there. And when we're presenting data, I think we have an opportunity to, to take a further look at disaggregation, right? So in this inst instance, we were looking at retention of African-American students, drilling down to see what percentage of those African-Americans were male, undocumented, had a high school GPA lower than 2.0, were first gen, were Pell, were students from low income high schools. Because again, it's taking that intersectional approach and drilling deeper. And the PDP dashboards give you the chance to not look at all of these intersectionalities, but many of them. And then when you do data analyses, you can ask the equity-minded questions, right, on your research brief. What contributes to the success of students who do persist, right? Look at the bright spots too, who is succeeding? What do they have in common? Um, what kind of support do first-gen students and students with lower high school GPAs need to persist, right? So just build those sense-making equity questions into your analyses and then um, providing opportunities to promote sense-making with the language that you use, calling for a drive to action, ensuring the data is shared with audiences. And a lot of times, you know, I was an institutional researcher for years so focused on doing the data request and the data analyses and the data reports, not building in the time to actually have the data discussions around those, but that should be a really critical part of moving that sense making and moving into to action. And there's a lot of different engagement activities that you can do to promote sense making through data summits. Um, and I have a link for you in the resources that gives protocols for how to do some of these, even in virtual environments. And, you know, data leads to more questions, that culture of inquiry, right, as we drill down. And it, again, data does, isn't the answer, but it leads to what else do we need to know to better understand that. Um, and so having that question generation, not just for further analysis, but also about our structures, policies, practices, and what have you um, to, make, to make sure that we're moving those into um, an equity-minded direction. So here's some tools for you. Um, the Center for Urban Education, when Estella Bensamon retired, she made all of her all of the center's racial equity tools available open source and they were all refreshed over the summer. So they have a great data guide. They have lots of great tools. The exercise we did in the breakout room was from that toolkit. Highly recommend the book Equity Talk to Equity Walk. At ATD, we did an all organization read. A lot of the colleges that I work with are doing book talks and you can get it hard copy. You can get it as an ebook or if you have a your college has a Wiley subscription. 
um, you can get PDF versions to share. That's what we did at ATD. We got the PDF version and put it in everybody's learning portal. Um, here's a link to the post-secondary data partnership. And there's all kinds of resources there, how to join, you know, videos on the dashboards, research questions on how to use the dashboards. So that's a, a great resource that's continually updated, right? Um, so if you haven't checked it out recently, I encourage you to do so. And then ultimately, you know, we want to be data champions and I get data Jedis for right justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So the PDP can um, provide us with dashboards, benchmarks, and analysis ready files that really can help us monitor the impact of pathway performance. I'm sorry, my dogs are misbehaving. Um, uh, monitor the impact of pathway reforms and really help us advance our equity agenda. They allow us to take an intersectional approach and identify who is succeeding and who is experiencing equity so we can um, drill down deeper and then really support our culture of inquiry, evidence, and continuous improvement. Um, so would be love to take your questions. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or just go ahead and um, unmute yourself and, and ask them. We have a great team here of like Jake's here. They have dashboards. Lisa is here from the Clearinghouse. Um, Bobby Fry, who did the data reporting for um, Central Piedmont when she worked there and has supported many colleges in doing um, their data submission. So we'd just like to open the floor for questions. I just have a basic beginner question. I just went to the website. Can anybody who wants have access to the dashboard? I just, I didn't go to the first one, sorry. This is just totally base level. Oh, that's a great question, Angela. The, um, yes, um, once your institution has your dashboards, um, your PDP user administrator can give anyone across the institution password access to get into the dashboards. You actually log in from the PDP website that we shared with you. There's a little user portal there and that's where you go to log in. Thank you. And the nice thing is, is that there is not a per user license fee like there are for like Power BI and some other packages. So you can like democratize those dashboards and that data um, as broadly as you would like. And there's also the option to opt in to a public um, like for you to put on your website a public facing dashboard with key metrics, which is really great because some accreditors ask for that, right? And that can help with um, just showcasing your, your outcomes for your community. Uh, I'm, I'm having some weird technical problems. Can and can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I just wanted to say, Angela, I put in the chat that you guys just submitted data, so you'll be able to um, get that soon, which is exciting. Yeah, I know this is specific to me, but I'm also trying to think about like which dashboard, since I'm curriculum chair, like kind of really pertain to this isn't maybe not this dashboard, but others that I've seen, like what could I link to when they're doing curriculum submissions and hey, go check this out and see what, you know, and just kind of get that data right where, 
the stakeholder can use it right when they're thinking about whatever that relevant question is. So yeah. And an exciting enhancement to the PDP is that you can create now like a global view. So because there's a lot of data in those dashboards, right? So if there's a certain mix of filters or cohorts that you want to focus on and be monitoring, you can create that global view so you don't have to go through that every time, right? Yeah, no, that's thank, thank you. That's awesome. We're all excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right, well, I wanna um, thank you all so much for joining us on a Friday afternoon. And I wanna thank our presenters and facilitators and thank Sorrel um, for, for inviting us to do this session. Um, so thank you all so much. This is amazing information and I'm really glad it's recorded because I think there are a lot of people who are gonna benefit from this. Um, moving forward. And for you guys, I know you're not even on the West Coast, so it's like Friday night for you all. Extra grateful. <laughs> Our pleasure. Talk to you all soon. Thank you.